Good afternoon, everybody. <laughs> um, so this is one view of the world. This is our archway. This is our Archives New Zealand's item model, quite a high level abstraction of it. This is my view of the world. Um, <laughs> Um, each dot on here represents a record, um, but each dot on here could also represent a person, a place, an agency. Um, each line on here represents a uh, relationship between each of those entities. Um, uh, and it looks like a network graph, uh, and that's because it is. Um, and uh, records and items are connected across many different um, record keeping and archival contexts. Um, across functions, people, agencies, subject, context, references, subject, data, file formats. There's all these connections across file formats that we can, that we can find and reach to. Um, and there are no boundaries. So we can have a, a record at Archives New Zealand um, that references a record that may still not have been transferred to Archives New Zealand that, that might sit at the Department of Conservation, for example. Um, and we know this, the continuum, the continuum model talks about um, many contexts over space and time. Um, and the ICI uh, draft conceptual model uh, records in context. Um, the, long after I started writing what this paper might be, uh, I saw in September at the, um, from the tweets at the ICA, uh, they have 73 relationships that you can connect between item to item or record to record. Um, there's a problem there. There's 73 relationships that the ICA, ICA asks us to talk about. But I can only see three if I look at the model um, without hurting my brain too much that I think I might be able to automate has copy, uh, is copy of, um, and has part. Um, and there may be some reciprocal relationships that I'm missing there. But, uh, and I, I, I think the purpose of this paper is that 73 is a really ambitious task for anyone, and I think we need to think perhaps about um, commodity ways of automating the descriptive process uh, where, in the interim, uh, where we haven't got the resource to describe things manually, we, we can use automatic relationships to help drive uh, discovery, um, uh, all sorts of things along the, um, the life cycle of a, of a record, which I'll talk about later on. Um, the Archives New Zealand context of this paper as well is that in 2011 we started having discussions about our descriptive model. Um, it wasn't quite completed, uh, but while we were talking about the relationship that might, that might exist between records, archivists started raising questions about how we were going to populate these descriptions. Um, it was acknowledged that given the volumes of digital records likely to be in each transfer, neither agency nor archive staff were likely to examine the content of items visually, done, uh, visually one by one to determine which other items they referred to. Um, you can't see her name there, but uh, Tally Masters um, provided me that sentence, and she's our digital archivist at Archives New Zealand. Um, so what then can we do? Well, of course, digital records, there's mathematical relationships between each of them, because we can... Um, Digital records are built upon signals, which are built upon numbers, and encoding schemes, which turn themselves into data structures, and of course become file formats, and inside the file formats we have user content. But if you go back the way, and all we have is a series of numbers, and we can use the properties of the numbers to, to start to think about how, um, the relationships between records. So we can say a record is equal than, greater than, less than. Um, a string, the, a string is just a word or a set of words represented in computer form, um, and they're just big numbers that we can compare. Therefore, a record is a big number that we can compare. So we can take some of these ideas and start to think about the relationships between records. Um, yeah, in the relationship between numbers, we can find the relationships between records. Uh, and as I was writing this paper, I was trying to think about what are the most likely relationships that would be most... Uh, the, the most sensible relationships that we can pull out of records automatically this way. Um, and so I've, uh, I found about eight relationships, a um, couple of different methods more than that, to talk about today. Um, and I'll just go through them one by one. Um, and I've decided to go through relationships one by one and then go to some dis discussion points at the end. Um, relationship one is identical. Um, and so this is... Uh, core piece of information that we that we uh, that 
at least at Archives New Zealand, we know we need when we are doing a digital transfer, we need to know that the record is unchanged from the point that it was at the agency to the point that it goes into the digital archive. But the, the, the information that helps us with this sits in the digital archive. Um, it doesn't sit in the descriptive model. It doesn't sit in the catalog. Um, so this first relationship just talks about how we surface that information to the catalog so that across the catalog, we can talk about items that are the same as another item. Um, if we can do that, then if we have a look at this model here, I, I've just copied, I've just created two archways in this image, um, but that could be another agency's um, a, a archive, it could be our archive, but we have just created, if we, if we expose the information that one record is identical to another record, which could happen um, in a situation where perhaps um, uh, you may have been communicating with an agency or a minister, um, and, the, and they've, they've kept the same information as another agency. Um, and you've connected two records across subseries, across series, across agency, across function, just because you know that they're identical. Um, I don't know what the probabilities are of this of happening, but at least if the information is there, if it does happen, we can find it. Um, relationship two. I wanted to discuss was, uh, is the item similar to another item? Um, with the checksums that we use to um, inform whether one item is identical to another item, um, they tend to look like this. Uh, so this is a MD5 checksum um, for a file. Uh, the top one is just the file. And then if I change a single byte in that checksum, then it radically changes the string that you see below. Um, and I, and I, there are, I, I can't see any similarities between the two strings there. But we can use another type of checksum, uh, another type of hashing function called a fuzzy hash. Um, and a fuzzy hash will give a point value in terms of similarity between one file and another file. So if I take um, one record uh, as, as, as my control, and then I change the first 250 bytes, we can see that these two strings here are really similar to one another. Um, but there are two changes, the C and the B highlighted in red. And to the tool that produces this, um, a tool called SSDeep, the files are, are, are 99 uh, points similar. I, I, refrain, I, I, I won't use the word percentage because the tool itself doesn't use percentage. Um, the first experiments I've been looking at here um, have been using two tools. One's called SSDeep. Um, uh, that uses... Um, uh, a method that was first pioneered by, uh, I believe, Andrew Tritchwell, who is, who's an Australian. Um, and then uh, this other one, TLSH, which is called um, Trend Local Microsensitivity Analysis, uh, which is also a Melbourne company, I think. Um, uh, and, and Oliver and co that, that wrote the, one of the papers about TLSH says that for, when we look at these uh, sensitivity analysis between two digital files, um, we have to tune them for each application. And I'll show you some graphs in a minute, which, which will help um, me give you some context behind that. Um, the first application we were hoping to use uh, fuzzy hashing or uh, sensitivity, sensitivity hashing for is for, for sentencing. So, um, we're in an early period of digital transfer at Archives New Zealand. We are still finding records that perhaps haven't been sentenced as well at the agency. We recognize that this is help uh, the agencies might need. Um, and so there's a period where we'll be looking at records and giving that advice back about how they can better do sentencing. If we find one record that uh, is not of archival value, we can potentially take one of those files um, as a seed to one of these algorithms and look at the lines in the graph that move from that record to um, find other potentially similar records that may also not have been sentenced correctly. So this would work well for form-like data, um, fax cover sheets that have been scanned, um, and we're still trying to find out other applications for that as well. Um, and we need to do something like this. I, I want to... This presentation talks about description, or well, the title does anyway, but. I think all of these relationships that we can expose have, have a use throughout the life of a record. Um, and I only use life of, of, a, of a record because it's easier to just linearize it. But as we know, there's many dimensions to a record. Um, but I'll show you some graphs. Um, 
With regular checksums, the graph on the left is, is disconnected. There's no relationship between any of the files. Um, with a fuzzy hash, we can see that there are definite trends in that graph uh, that, were, um, that, that perhaps we can exploit. This is an example of a graph I created when I first started doing this experimentation. Uh, it represents, there's a lot of, uh, many groups of connected graph, um, but not every record is connected to another record. What you're seeing here is a, a situation where um, each of the blocks of graphs here uh, tend to be different file formats. And so this was a collection of many different file formats for the purpose of testing digital preservation tools. Um, and it just helps to show me that there are definite relations that we can pull between records this way, um, but we still need to think about how we apply them in an archival context. Uh, the big blob in the middle are zero byte files. Um, so, uh, and this is, this is uh, two graphs of uh, records that we have ingested into the digital archive. Um, I'll talk more about these on Friday at the workshop. Um, and here, the cool thing about these two graphs is uh, they're from two different transfers, yet the graphs aren't connected. So it, we, we've configured a threshold here that shows that there is a relationship between two transfers. Um, the question about how we continue this is can we narrow the net even further to find closer relationships between two digital files? Um, and slightly facetiously, I wondered if we started to expose this relationship as well in the um, catalog, uh, in the descriptive model, we could say, you like this record, perhaps you'll like this one as well. Uh, relationship three, um, this is where we start to do more heuristic-like analysis. Um, but really, this is just nascent beginnings for us because we're still focusing on transfer. I'm also trying to keep one eye on what happens next. Um, and so here is an, uh, there was a study done in 2015 uh, where 64,000 e-thesis were studied by a university in Edinburgh. And 46,000 uh, links inside these e-thesis pointed out to external websites. Of course, on an external website, you can find PDFs to other files. You can find links to other websites. You can find many other files. Um, so I did had a look at what we had in our first four main transfers, and so this is a little shell script that I created. It's not the it's not the smartest script in the world, and, and there's other ways I can approach this. Um, but the main line here in the middle, uh, we use a tool called CatDoc um, that will output all of the content of Microsoft Word files. Uh, we use another tool called Grep, uh, which is a regular expression pattern matching tool. And we just look for the, the HTTP colon forward slash forward slash um, uh, string. And we, we run it across the files in the collection. Um, there's a link to the results here. And out of 5,059 files that could be read by the tool, we actually found 4,800 lines which make, that can contain one or more hyperlinks. Um, the purpose of this presentation was not to say that this was a risk, or this was dangerous, or something that we needed to prioritize immediately. It was just to show you there was something out there that there is a relation to an external record in these, uh, an external piece of information in these files that we should start thinking about perhaps correcting going forward. Um, and if we take that idea about HTTP links, we can also think about content management system uh, references that we have in records. So here I use a similar approach to do a regular expression pattern against the what I know uh, we have an EDRMS at work called Objective, and some of you may know that. Um, but when you link to an Objective file, you can often use uh, a six-digit number uh, preceded with a letter A. If we look for, for these, if um, I didn't do this on the four transfers because I know they didn't come from objective-based systems. But if the agency were to send us a pattern that matched their content management system uh, references, then on transfer, we could also run this analysis across those records and find anywhere that external records that are still in their custody are referenced um, that we might want to ask them for 
or we might just to tell surface to the user to tell them you're looking at this record, but beware that there's another record sitting in someone else's content management system. Um, a lot of the relationships I talk about here right now, because it is just early stages, I want to talk about just flagging them to the user, to the end user, so that the user has all the information they require to be able to, uh, to work with the records that, that they're given. Uh, relationship five contains embedded object. Um, this is one of my, I, the text is a bit small, but this is an analysis, analysis on, a, on one of my favorite records um, from the first four transfers, and it's a digital futures summit um, from about 2007, which talks about how we're gonna do digital preservation in the New Zealand context. Um, I, I don't think much progressed over those years until, until recently, but the, um, the PowerPoint has, I think, 73 embedded objects in there. And so this is where I think that this part of the presentation starts to think about what a digital, well, the HTTP links as well, but this is where the relationships we can find here as a flag, a flag that you have embedded content you might want to deal with, it also has an implication for digital preservation. Because in here we have JPEG files, we have uh, ping files, um, uh, there's a couple of other file formats in there as well that the file format on its own PowerPoint is difficult to handle, but we might also want to think about preservation strategies for each of the files inside. The files inside may also have, uh, have value of their own. For example, they may be records that um, in their own right, because someone might have embedded a record as a Word document. The problem here is, what well, is it, is that it requires you to build an infrastructure that becomes recursive in nature. And so I've put here, um, the, the, the snake starts eating its own tail because you have to, if you were to extract the records from one digital object, the files from one digital object, you'd have to then rerun them through your work throw, workflow to identify them as identical records that might sit in a different context in your, record, in your, in your archive or another person's records management system. So, I do, so one thing you, so to explain, if I, take, uh, if I take an email and I embed it in a, in a Word document because I want to reference it, the email may be accessions. The Word document may also be accessions. And the Word document contains an email that was accessions. So I need to pull the email out of that file, compare it, create a checksum for it, and compare it across the contexts to figure out if it's identical to anything else we hold. This is possible. It's computationally expensive, but it's a relationship that we can uh, we can pull out automatically. That we, I, I think we have an obligation to express if we can find it. Um, relationship seven contains object reference. Uh, this is an even greater digital preservation risk than perhaps an embedded file, because at least with an embedded object, everything is there, and and if you're trying to preserve a bit stream, everything will remain there. Uh, you just have to think about how you deal with it in the future. But this relationship, if you can find these files, this talks about files that another file references and may use for, uh, let's say, display. So in Johnny's presentation earlier, he was using sound files. Those sound files may be embedded in the file, but they may also just sit within the same folder on his desktop or where he's working from. The, were that to become a, a record that was transferred to the National Archive, the National Archive would want to know that those sound files were also in the presentation. And we found this example in one of our collections uh, where a PowerPoint had, uh, was it five, seven videos associated with it? And those videos just happened to sit in the same folder. And we still haven't got the workflow that is needed to be able to connect these records together. Um, I, I think there's no problem saying that we found these relationships through luck. We were, we were exploring the collection. We looked at the PowerPoint and we found that the video was there. And then we wondered, where is this video coming from? And we looked in the folder and there they were. Um, and we were able to connect them back together uh, to create a single intellectual entity within the digital archive. Um, and we can create mechanisms to find these files. Uh, it's just difficult. So, we can, uh, in the same way that you would unzip a zip file, you can unzip uh, what a Microsoft PowerPoint is. And if you look inside that PowerPoint, you'll find other files. 
And in those files, you'll find something that looks like this, hexadecimal sequences, again, numbers, that in this case tell us that the file, uh, you extract the files from the PowerPoint, read the PowerPoint file, and you look for this string of sequence, this sequence of numbers um, beginning 000F00, and the movie name is at the end, uh, M Tobe Sham WMV. We can use existing tools to, such as uh, Droid by the National Archives UK to create identifiers, or new tools that aren't Droid that also run this process to identify this type of object. And it's a relationship that, again, exists between a digital object that we can find automatically and just give to the user because we can find it. Uh, item mentions. Um, in the same way that we, we ran through each of the Word documents in our collection to pull out HTTP links, we can reuse the same process to run it across a dictionary to look for key terms that we're interested in. So in this case, I've just, uh, in this case, I've got a Wikipedia article about Helen Clark, and if our dictionary said Helen Clark, Helen Elizabeth Clark, John Key, we can say that we can positively identify a entity that we're interested in that's mentioned in the article. And I'm not saying anything about this relationship other than it mentions something that you might be interested in. And we can do this, again, using simple tools. Uh, it was a message from Ruggs, uh, Tim Sherratt's presentation earlier that, that uh, he mentioned one of his hacks as being a simple hack. I think, hopefully, um, while some of the terminology I use here might seem complex, we can skill our, our users in being able to do simple command line things like this to, to read the information on the right there and compare it against the information on the left and to just say, this mentions this, and let's put it as a relationship. No bias, nothing to it, just a relationship that exists in the record in the, in the catalog. We can use um, named entity recognition as well, where perhaps this is the wrong way around, named entity recognition will just say a person is mentioned, a place is mentioned, a year is mentioned. This is Stanford's named re um, entity recognition tool. Um, if you were to just copy and paste a piece of text into this, it will highlight entities, as you see here. Um, but it's only one step away from being able to automate this, to just say, this is a relationship, this is a relationship, this is a relationship. But we need the data structures to be able to support this. Um, they need to be uh, extensible enough not to know what the future holds. And this is where I, the, I think I, I've already heard this a lot of times over the conference, graph technologies is going to come in handy. Um, we need to look at things as networks, records as networks. Um, if we look at this New Zealand um, standard from 2015, it says the digital world is increasingly using networked relationships. Verhoeven, in her recent uh, article, um, talks about the devil's bridges. Um, the devil's bridges being the infrastructure we need to support this type of relationship being built inside discovery uh, systems. Uh, she uses the idea of vernacular ontologies. I'm not sure if this quite fits, but it's, it, there's, there's something very casual about what I'm talking about here that perhaps doesn't sit easy with everyone here, but I hope maybe we can have a discussion and think about what we can do. Uh, we, need to, uh, we need these relationships to understand uh, that we need this infrastructure to allow us to understand, make, and improve the quality of our connections, she says. Um, and she talks, one of my favorite things about this, this article that, that she wrote is about the redistribution of power and the possibilities of world making and remaking in an archive. Um, and then what is, what is this uh, in terms of freeing up bias if we're just using tools to automate the extraction of relationships? There's no bias, there's no cognition going into this other than the fact that a mechanism exists to say there is a person mentioned here, that this person may be of interest and it's all done by a computer. Um, it's the cognition behind creating relationships between records that worries me. Um, because, again, um, Records in Context talks about 73 different relationships that could potentially exist item to item. But 
if we take an innocuous one such as draft? And I, I asked some questions, uh, just as a thought experiment. Is it still a draft if 80% uh, of the content is different from what is published? Is it still a draft if, if it was used in the wild? Is it a draft because someone marked it as such within the EDRMS? Um, that last one's an important one because it could be marked as draft in the EDRMS, and that potentially is one of your automated relations because you can run that regular expression tool to look for the word draft. But you haven't got anyone there telling you that it was just a draft. Um, and and the sub, uh, has subjects, what are the semantics behind that? Uh, what, is the, what is the actual topic of this presentation? Um, but at the same time, I don't want to criticize the records in contexts uh, draft work at the moment because it also says some really good things about graph databases and the infrastructure that's going to be needed to be able to support this type of work moving forward. And it talks about how we will use these relationships to find multiple perspectives and multiple avenues of access. Uh, I think the introduction to that paper is really good, so I recommend everyone go and have a look at that as well. Um, and there's a, the, there is an impact for each of these relationships for record keeping at the agency, for transfer, for digital pres preservation, of course, discovery. For digital preservation, I think, I mean, I will go away and work on those. That's my, that's my main role at Archives New Zealand. So I'll be trying to find, even if these aren't relationships that we expose to the user through the catalog, they're the relationships that I'm interested in because I need to know if there are other records being spoken about or other files being spoken about that also need preserving. Um, and there's something here as well about, I wanted to talk about the IPRES conference that, that has just been and gone. So that's the Digital Preservations Annual Conference. And there was a lot of geekery in the room, from, following on on the tweets online anyway. And I, and I wanted to just bring us back to some of the use cases for digital preservation and the requirements of an archive. And I, I think it's not all about dichotomies of emulation versus migration. I think some of it is how we provide discovery uh, m layers for the user, how we support the archivists in, in, in making decisions, and how we support transfer. Um, and in my conclusion, I just borrow it straight from, uh, from this paper about fuzzy hashing by Kornblum in 2006. Um, and I think that he talks about some of the same problems that, that we're going to have to face within the, the born digital world. Um, computer forensic examiners are often overwhelmed with data. Modern hard drives contain more information that cannot be manually examined in a reasonable time period, creating a need for data reduction techniques. And I think if nothing else, some of these relationships will give us just uh, data reduction techniques. Um, and how do we begin? Well, I've given you eight, eight relationships that we could potentially use. Uh, and, and I spoke in GovSig yesterday, and I spoke about the difficulty that some government agencies seem to have in making projects big. I think if you just pick one at a time and you just build one at a time, uh, that's probably just the way to go. So m I might go back and just start looking at HTTP links in files. Someone else might look at servicing the um, identical identicalness of two records through putting checksums through to the catalog. That's all we can do right now. Um, I'm not asking for any more than that. And I think perhaps some of the standards that have been pushed out, such as ICA, should think about maybe just reducing their scope a little bit. I've got some links here, some links about checksums, SS compare, TLSH, parallel lines. Uh, so the workshop on Friday, there's some stuff I've, I've covered here that we'll also discuss on Friday. But then finally, the, the slides are a bit messed up, but everyone should go away and have a look at Apache Tika. Um, while the paper, hopefully, uh, I, I will try the publishing route through archives and manuscript, um, and there's a lot more information in there. Um, and I mentioned quite a few different tools. Apache Tika right now is one of the ones that can do 90% of everything I've talked about here. So please have a look at that, um, and thank you for your time.